Hello and welcome to this week's Teach Me Tuesday. My name is Lisa. I'm a neonatal nurse educator and an experienced NICU nurse here to bring you another topic broken down. If you watched last week's Teach Me Tuesday, then you should have been ready for today, right? I said we were going to talk more about PIV insertion and here we are. PIVs are probably the most common line you will see in a NICU, whether you work in a level two, a level three, a level four. Almost every baby in the NICU at some point probably has an IV, whether that's on admission or for later in life if they need a blood transfusion or they have a septic workup, whatever it might be. So we use them to give fluids, medications, boluses, so many things. We do you use central lines, which we all know. We use lots of central lines, and often for our smallest babies, they will start with central lines. That's very true. But there are times when even our smallest babies are going to need peripheral IVs. And this is something that even if you've done an IV on adult, it is more nuanced in a VLBW, an ELBW, or even a 12-pound baby, right, with their thick skin and maybe a cardiac baby with poor perfusion. So what we're going to go through today are the slides like we always do, but I'm also going to be talking about some tips and tricks and experiences that I've had that will hopefully help you. I also have some demos today. I've got some dolls with me, so I'm going to show you some positioning techniques, and so we'll be kind of using the camera in that way, so just to prepare you for that. Um, and then I encourage you to be paying attention to my social medias. I'm going to be doing more of that throughout the week um, for this week of Teach Me Tuesday with the topic of peripheral IV insertion. So why do babies need PIVs? Why do NICU babies? Why can't we give everybody UVC? As we all know, central lines come with their own risk, a risk of a central line infection. They are more central, so we've had um, risks of air embolus, clot formation, and of course, dislodgement and infection. So we use PIVs when we can, especially in our older babies, to give IV fluids, antibiotics, of course, blood transfusions, emergency access, medications, and of course, TPN as needed. All of these things could be temporary, right? We may only have the IV in for a short period of time. We may put in a peripheral IV for a blood transfusion and only be in for 48 hours. I have seen IVs in for seven days, whether that's running TPN that weaned down to D10 that's now weaning off or giving antibiotics. So we can do a lot, right? When I first started, I feel like maybe we used more IVs, and now we're kind of shifting more to UVs. Either way, the number one thing I can recommend for you is if your unit does not have a line placement algorithm to be a part of a team that would create that. And that would be something like, if I am born less than, whatever, 31 weeks, 1,500 grams, we're going to go for a UVC. If I am born more than that, we will try for a PIV. These are the number of attempts that we do before we go to the next person. I'm going to be sharing some examples of this throughout my social media this week, so be paying attention for that. But really this idea of kind of what would we do next, what to anticipate would come next. Now, can you have a UVC on a one-month-old baby? No, we don't have that access anymore. So in that situation, we're going to be going for this peripheral IV. Of course, we have other emergency type lines such as IOs, IJs, femoral lines, etc. So that's why we would need peripheral IVs. So you get your order. It's time to place a peripheral IV. What's the first thing you do? You're going to gather your supplies. So you've already checked your orders. That goes without saying, right? We already know we're going to need the IV. We need to make sure we grab the right size catheter. Most likely you're using a 24 gauge. I have never seen anything else outside of this, but I also know that I have um, people that are subscribing from other countries. So maybe you do something else or it's called something else. But here we use 24 gauge. IV catheters. There are a few types. My personal preference is the push button catheter, probably because that's what I used for the majority of my career and got the most comfortable with it. You are going to need something to clean the skin with, whether that's alcohol or chlorhexidine, whatever your unit protocol is. I most commonly have used chlorhexidine in my experience um, using the swabs, most likely. When I first started, we would drop, we had a bottle of chlorhexidine and we would drop it on a two by two and use it that way. So different ways there. Um, you always want to sterile two by two gauze because it gets to clean things up. Saline flush, your transparent dressing, an arm board if you're going to use it, additional tape, gloves for you, tourniquet for baby, sucrose for baby. 
and then you're grabbing your best friend, right? You need someone in that room, and it could be the parent if they're comfortable with this procedure, but someone that's A, gonna contain the baby, but really I always have a friend that's gonna help me with my flushing and my taping. We'll talk about the taping a little bit as we go here. So next we're gonna prepare the baby. So I have two babies here. I've got this little doll, and I want you to know that my daughter um, bought this doll, and it was not what she thought it was. And I said, well, you know what? I can use that for my NICU videos because it is so tiny. So this baby is in a positioning device. And I don't mind that, right? She looks great here in a little dandelion too. This is a great place for her to be during this um, IV poke. What I always do is I get the baby turned onto their side, the side I'm going to have access to. So for me, that would be getting their hand um, up on top here onto their side. So I could re- swaddle her in here with just leaving her hand out and use her little dandelion to still keep her comfortable. So during this procedure, she's comfortable. I'm comfortable. She's developmentally positioned. I have access to the limb I need here. I'm going to be using the hand, right? And she's in a nice comfortable spot. Someone could be doing um, containment over here like a parent or next to me with helping with the IV. If we have an infant that is swaddled, right? So I have maybe a slightly older baby, they're going to be in a blanket swaddle. Again, I would get them into the position I want. Let's say on this baby, we're going to do a foot. Um, I am a hand, foot, side of the arm type of gal. Those are my preferred locations for starting IVs. So I would get both of those hands in, get that little foot out for me, and still have maintained in this swaddle so that, here she is, and she looks so cute in her little swaddle, and I've got her foot out. I've got where I want to poke up. I'm not trying to awkwardly put something underneath. I've got her head at a good place for me. And now she's comfortable and I'm comfortable, right? That's the most important thing is you don't want to be standing on the side of the bed that's not going to help you and you're going to be reaching over. That's not developmentally appropriate and it's going to be too awkward for you. So you've got your two infants ready to go. I'm going to use her as my demo. We've used our swaddle. If you have sucrose on your unit, you want to be getting that two minutes prior to a poke. So I do that. I get them positioned. This is also going to keep them warm. If you're in a giraffe type of incubator or an Adam I or a baby Leo, you've probably popped your top, which they do come out with some heat. But what can you do to help keep the infant warm during this? This is also going to help with that. And then using a light if needed or anything else and dimming the lights in your room as you can. So you're going to choose your site. In this infant, I've chosen her hand. We use hands feet, forearms, lower leg, back of the leg, and the scalp. I'm going to tell you, I am not a scalp expert. I've been doing, being a NICU nurse for 21 years. I think I've successfully started like 10 scalp IVs. But you give me a foot, the side of the arm, love that. Down the thumb, love it. So I've got other specialties, but that is not mine. So kudos to you that it is. If your infant has previously had an IV infiltration recently or an issue with a, a limb, a healing injury, a skin breakdown, a tape injury. If they have a pick line in one limb, you do not start the IV in the same limb. So all of those are reasons you would not do it if they've had a perfusion issues. I know that I've worked on a unit where if a baby had a radial art line, we did not start an IV in that same limb for about a week after that line came out, just as that was healing. So if you're going to do something like that, you should have a sign, in my opinion, on your um, bed right? That says, hey, this is not a limb we can use right now. So we've chose our site. So we've gotten our self positioned. We've got the baby positioned. We've given sucrose. We've got our helper, our container if needed, and we're ready to go. So we want to make sure we cleanse well, we have our, our helper, and then we're going to get ready to pull that skin taut. One thing that I think is really important that I always do, I use a tourniquet sometimes, but not always. So really assessing what does this vessel look like and do I need a tourniquet for it or not? If we use tourniquets, as we know, we use small rubber bands in the NICU that are just trimmed. I think this idea of really pulling the skin taut. So if we are here, I use my forefinger to pull the skin back. And I'm kind of almost using my forefinger and my middle finger as my own tourniquet. That way I can kind of control how tight that gets. And if I don't like the vessel, I'm getting off quickly and allowing for refill. But if I'm doing a hand, I'm going to use my thumb to kind of push the fingers down and then my forefinger to pull the skin taut. I really do believe that if you have the skin pulled taut, the needle goes in easier. So that's just something to think about. One of my tricks 
and to go in with confidence, right? You want to go in at your angle and poke and go in, but you're going to get your baby nice and set up for success. And so if you're doing a foot, let's bring back our other model today. So here's my foot. I will even kind of hold along the side here with my hand at the bottom of the foot so that I can see the whole vessel. It's also possible to do it like this so that you're seeing a side, uh, it's not helpful to you, a side vein, right? If you're doing the back of the leg, you're going to go up the back and have the, uh, the leg exposed in this way. But really just getting that your hand into a good position and pulling that skin taut, I think really helps set you up for success. I have my other model back. So now it's time to poke, right? And so when you're ready, you've gotten yourself set up for success. You are pulling the skin taut. You're going to get your needle and you're going to start at an angle. And that is so that you can puncture both the skin and the vessel, but you don't want to go through. And I have this picture here. I'm going to link this YouTube video. It's amazing on all my socials. It's an it looks like an adult skin, but it's the same idea. You're going to go in and you're going to level off. I always talk about like an airplane that's kind of coming in. You're going to go in. You want to get in the vessel, but you want to stay in there. You want the catheter to float within the fluid. And if you go all the way through with your needle, then you've punctured through instead of in. So starting at your angle and leveling out is going to make you the most successful. When you have blood return, you want to insert all the way until your catheter is in and then flush with saline. While flushing with saline, you're looking to make sure that it's not bigger, getting bigger, that it's not blanching. Has anyone accidentally started an IV in an artery before? Right? There's no swelling, blanching, um, or resistance going on there. If you're not sure, first, you always get a second set of eyes. Have someone else come, your bar partner that's already there helping you, that's going to help you with taping it. And then you say to each other, okay. Is this in? Is it not in? And have it. If it really is too questionable, I take it out because the worst possible outcome here is an infiltrate um, with severe extravagation, extravagation, and I just don't want to do that. So I would take it out. So now we're going to secure the line, which is some of the hardest thing that we do. And the reason that securing the line is so hard is because you don't want to make it too tight, but you want to take it, make it tight enough, and you want to have your vessel your area of your arm exposed without you know doing anything to compromise how well it's in there or getting it dirty so it is so tricky to make sure you're doing it right but you definitely want to put that transparent dressing which i always say to put on top first because you've cleaned the area and now you're securing the cleanliness in i do see people doing that chevron piece first which is what you would see kind of here this x or going down the sides I think when you do that, you're then putting like dirty gloves on there. And I personally don't do that. So I put my trussing down right on top so it's ready to go. Then I put my chevron, my pants, my U that goes down the side, and then another piece of tape over. Ideally, this one here is actually my favorite. And the reason that is, is because the window of the tegaderm is over where it would start leaking or blanching. This one, um, number two here, is okay. I don't love this like kind of darker tape as much as the other. I know it's not dark, that's not quite the word I want. Um, it's just you can't quite see as well and the teddy bear is kind of going over that insertion site. So just something to think about. This foot is well secured. I like the idea of using the posy to hold the arm board on because you can take it well, in this case, a footboard, you can take it on and off easily to be able to check underneath. Um, some units do require labeling the site with the date and time, so know what your unit requirements are for that before leaving the area. So here is a step-by-step -step of kind of everything I've done. I am going to let you screenshot this. I have a printable handout. If you want something, please reach out to me and let me know. Get me your email address. I will send this to you. It will be on my website by the end of the week as well, so you can check it out there. I'm not going to go through step by step. This is just all the things and kind of some tips and tricks put all together for you to think about as you're doing these IVs. Um, I think the most important thing is if you are using a tourniquet is making sure your tourniquet's in a good spot and that you remember to release it when you're flushing. So those are going to be key to this as well.
So your IV is in, it's going well. How often should you be checking your IV? You said one hour, right? You said that out loud to yourself. We check our central lines and going in fluids every one hour. And a good thing to remember is act. I should be assessing, comparing, and touching to make sure that I know what is going on here. Assess, is it patent? Is it, if I need to flush it, is it flushing easily? Are my IV fluids going off okay? My pump's not alarming. If I flush after med, did that go well? Um, when I look at it, do my what do my eyes tell me in my visual assessment? Is there any redness, swelling, or blanching? Then I'm comparing. Remember, you we are bilateral human beings, so you have two sides. I take one hand, I compare it to the other. I say, hey, do this sweet baby's hands look similar? Is one giant? Is their arm giant? Is their shoulder giant? Is there a problem going on in this baby? Do their feet look the same? Is their calf gotten big on one side? So I'm comparing those two sides to each other. And then I'm looking at it to make sure it's not firm, um, painful to the baby's touch, just touching around the area, especially if I've noticed any swelling. So infiltrations can happen very fast. It is our job as a NICU bedside nurse to report these immediately to a medical provider so that we will to A, stop your fluids, number one. If you think you have a problem with your line, stop your fluids. You can come have someone give you a second set of eyes. You can flush. And then if you know it's bad, especially if it infiltrates, then we escalate to a provider. We remove the line and then we treat it with um, whatever you're using. Some people put it in a bag and it absorbs. And then there's also the medication that you can put in to help with the five little pokes to help. So depending on what you do on your unit, it might vary based on my experience. But just that would be your next steps for um, an IV infiltration. It's really important with PIVs to remember your fluid compatibility and safety. We'll go over this more on social media this week and here on YouTube. But really just thinking about we cannot use dextrose greater than D12 and a half. If you're infusing blood through an IV, you cannot also be infusing your sugar. Sugar lyses red blood cells. So you're just giving a pointless transfusion. So you would need two access points. So that situation, you your baby may have a pick. And then you need a blood transfusion, and this is when you would be starting an IV. So that's another time a baby might need an IV. Always review your med and fluid compatibility. Watch for signs of phlebitis or extravasation. And then if you're going to need prolonged access, make sure you're switching to a central line as needed. So what can we tell our friends and our parents here? Right here we see our parent um, breastfeeding and holding their baby who has an IV. So we need to tell them, A, if you want, I will be right here every time you want to get the baby out. But if you want to do this independently, we need to make sure we have a lot of uh, movement in the line so it doesn't cause any drag. We don't want any pulling or tugging of the line. If they see any redness, if they notice any changes, let us know right away. Tell them why the infant hasn't. Remember, knowledge is power. And a lot of times what's happening with our parents is they're scared. They're scared why the infant has it, how long it's going to be in, if they'll ever get off of it. If it could go bad, remind them how we're checking every hour and what we're looking for. Knowledge is power. Share your knowledge with the families. So I hope you're going to join me throughout the week as we're going to talk more about peripheral IVs and tips and tricks. I hope our little mannequins were helpful today. Um, just reminding what good positioning looks like. We can keep PIVs in. We don't, in adult world, I actually don't know if this is true anymore, but I think in the adult world, in many units they take them out after 72 hours and replace them we don't do that in the NICU we keep them in until the it can't be kept in anymore it's not needed um so this isn't something that we're just like taking out even though it's still good so they can last a long time if we treat them well we take them well and we run the right things through them we can be very successful so remember take your time select your supplies Select your IV, get the baby in a good position, get yourself in a good position, and poke with confidence, and you will be successful.